can't buy It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach If you find the same And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders, founders you've heard of, some you've never heard of. Um, you know, I have Rich Goldstein. I'm going to introduce him in a second. He's one of the the best people I know, just, just a rock solid business mind, but also just one of the biggest givers I know. So if you don't know Rich Goldstein and his stuff, you need to check it out. And if you are lucky enough to get in his, his universe, you should be thankful because he's just one of those people that's always giving to his relationship. So um, on Spartan Insider, you know, I would check out some, some past interviews to check out. I always like to highlight a few. Um, you know, Rich, the funny thing is I had Oren Claff on who wrote Pitch Anything, Flip the Script, love it, love it. I introduced um, a couple of people who I thought people should check out. Just listen to the first three minutes. Oren actually rips into the people who I suggested uh, they check out my episode for. Um, and that's just his personality. He's a deal maker. I don't know. So just <laughs> listen to that the first four or five minutes and just tell me what you think of it. Uh, I don't know. I don't even want to give away anything else. Wait, this is four or five minutes of what now? Uh, the first four or five minutes of my Oren Claff uh, interview where he basic, I'm not even going to give it away, but he rips into the people. I say, hey, check out this one. Check out this ep- past episode on Inspired Insider. He rips into what I said. Okay, cool. Uh, yes. When I could take it, I have thick skin. But uh, it's interesting. Um, and this episode is brought to you by Rise25. If you don't know it, just check it out. Um, I feel like podcasting is the best thing that I've done for my relationships to create a platform and give to those relationships like Rich and, and other people. So I suggest every, any business, hands down, should have a podcast. And so you can check out more. Watch the video. John Corcoran and I started it. We banter like an old married couple in the video on the homepage so you can listen to us uh, do that. Um, and today as guest, I am super excited, uh, Rich Goldstein, and he runs Goldstein Patent Law. They help people protect their ideas and products. They've advised and obtained patents for thousands and thousands of companies. Let me, uh, Rich, actually bring up your site here. Um, thousands of companies, okay, over the past 25 years. So if you're a company, you have a software, you have a product, you have a design, you want to protect it, then go to goldsteinpatentlaw.com. They have some amazing free resources. He also has a podcast called, and he hosts Innovations and Breakthroughs, okay? And Rich, I'm just gonna pull that up right here. You have some amazing guests, like just Norm, Storm and Norm, if you like the bearded wonder here. You have James <laughs> Thompson, um, Buybox Experts, um, you know, I don't know Carlos. I'm sure he's, he's awesome. Yeah. Um, but Josh Snow, Roland Frazier. I mean, some amazing people here. So check out his podcast. It's it's really good. And he has a lot of experience and deals with a, a breadth of different businesses. So, Rich, thanks for joining me. Yeah, thank you. And, and, and thanks for the kind words and for the plug for my podcast. Totally. Um, and by the way, I didn't even mention... You know, he actually wrote the ABA Consumer Guide to Obtaining a Patent. He wrote for the American Bar Association. And he That's actually true. actually explains it in plain English. <laughs> so, you know, I wanted to start off, Rich, you know, where you, your your journey a little bit. But I wanted to talk about you are amazing at giving to relationships. And, you know, we were talking before we hit record here about some amazing people in your life. And you talked about Zach Leonard of Gemba, so people mm-hmm. could check that out. Um, Kevin King, Eel Co., which is, I guess, eel.co, and he, I guess, has household names in Amsterdam. Um, so maybe talk about when you meet people, you form these friendships and relationships. Um, why don't you talk about Kevin King for a second? Like how you met him and you just continue to do stuff together. Yeah. So Kevin King, let's see, I met him at Prosper show actually. Mm. Um, and, uh, another friend from a different mastermind, um, who, um, you know, said, Oh, have you met Kevin? You need to meet Kevin. So she brought me over to meet him and I talked to him about what I do and about how people in e-commerce really have a lack of information about patents and trademarks and how helpful it'd be for me to speak to his audience. And, 
he had me on what he was doing back then was the Illuminati, um, the, the Illuminati mastermind. Yeah. Um, and then from there, you know, we've been friends and we've been to different events. We, um, kind of sh- shared table with bottle service at Las Vegas. You know, we've hung out in Austin a number of times. Uh, just, he's a great guy. He's had me on his freedom ticket program, which, uh, I mean, so many people contact me after listening to me on his program. I mean, it's just really a, a, a great person. Mm. He's, he's very giving also. That's kind of maybe part of, I mean, it's like like-minded people, um, kind of get together in that way is that you, you have someone who, uh, I, I mean, I think in general, good people find each other. Yeah. And, um, and so how do you follow up with people? So like, you know, you also, part of making sure the relationships, you know, sustains over time is following up and keeping in touch. What, when you meet someone, like you met him for the first time, we met for the first time, by the way, I think, well, we were introduced by Chad Rubin. So shout out to Chad Rubin and Skubana, um, because he's like, Jeremy, you need to meet Rich. He's just an amazing human being. Um, yeah, what well, do you use to... another great connector? There's just an, uh, I'll give us a sec. I'll make a second to that shout out, Chad Rubin. Chad actually, um, is the one who invited me to Prosper Show. I met him at War Room. Uh, he was there speaking. Uh, we were at the airport coming back from Puerto Vallarta where we actually got to talk for the first time. And he told me a Prosper Show was happening. And he said, you know, come to the event. And I'll introduce you to everyone I know. And he really did. I mean, he mm. truly introduced me to dozens and dozens of people, including you, including James Thompson. Uh, I mean, uh, so that's kind of how that thing tends to happen is I, I think you meet connectors and they connect you with people. <laughs> so how do you follow up with people? Like take anyone, for example, I'd you meet at a conference. The, the two um, the, the two main follow-up systems I have, or the two main connection systems I have is just plain old Facebook, just making Facebook friends with someone. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also I uh, use an app that um, displays a barcode that lets them get my contact info and send me a message. There's this app that uh, another good friend of mine, this guy, Steve Esk, Steve Esk gets this, he created um, it's called lazy contact use that app. Mm. And then, um, you know, it's, it's real easy, lazy easy contact. Exchange info. That's great. Lazy contact. Yeah. So, um, uh, you know, just kind of t- something that has you remember the connection. It's so easy to meet so many people. And then just, if you don't do anything about it, if you don't kind of make a Facebook friend connection or even like Instagram or some other platform or get their contact info, it's just rather unlikely that you'll even remember mm. at some point in the future. Well, you get busy, right? So you use Facebook, you use lazy, lazy connect contact. You said lazy contact, lazy yep. contact. You also do something a little bit further. You send stuff out in the mail. Sometimes um, I got your book. That's true. Well, okay. And that's a, that's a um, kind of like the follow through from the connection using lazy contact. I mean, very mm. often when I'm talking to, to someone and they're just, they're interested somewhat in what I do, patents. I don't know why they're interested, but, <laughs> but they are. And protect so their talk, ideas is why they're interested, but yeah. Right, so I tell them, you know what? I'll, I'll send you a copy of my book. And, and so we exchange information and then I, I get that contact info over to my assistant and, and send them a book. So yeah, that actually is, I, I wasn't really present to that in this moment, but that's a major follow-up system of mine is when I meet people, I get their information, I send them a book. Yeah. There's something about getting something physical and tangible and it also lends itself to this authority and credibility if I get a book from you. Yeah, I, w- I would say so. I mean, that's one of the reasons I was really um, honored to be asked to write this book for the American Bar Association is because the, there is instant credibility with that. Like people say, oh, he's the guy who wrote the book on patents. So, yep. Anything else you do or any software or systems you use just for follow up in general? <laughs> it's, it's funny because what immediately comes to mind is, is like, uh, I'm so ADD that like I create systems and then I forget about them. <laughs> so they're not That's very kind of what you're supposed to do if, as long as they're running. No, I mean, I forget that I even, I got gotcha. you. I'll start a list and then I forget that I started a list. But, uh, um, yeah, I mean, in, in terms of, of systems that I'm currently using, I just have to say, I don't remember, <laughs> you know, one thing also besides the giving and connection follow-up aspect, um, that I totally respect 
is you are a constant learner and you always look to go to conferences and join uh, organizations of other like-minded people. Talk about some maybe colleagues or mentors that you look at for business advice or they look at you for business advice. Hmm. What kind of group, what kind of groups are you a part of? Well, I'm in War Room, um, which is a great mastermind. I mean, the so many people in there um, that I um, that I interface with and look to for advice. I mean, there's a, you know, Jan, Tam um, is a good, very good friend of mine. Um, the guy I mentioned, Steve Esk, he's in Australia. Also, um, someone I look to for advice like that. Um, mm-hmm. Sal Buscemi, uh, someone I have a lot of respect for. Jim Dew. Um, and, uh, I mean, just really so many others, like just in that group alone. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, genius network too. Um, and in genius network too, Jim do <laughs> Joe polish, of course. And, uh, uh, you know, lots of other folks. Um, uh, what have you, you know, learned Carol? from, from Joe polish? Um, he's a well, master I mean, he at, is, he is the ultimate connector. Yeah. So, um, even though his thing is marketing, um, I would say just observing the ease at which he connects. And I th- think one of his superpowers is just remembering people and mm-hmm. remembering even where he left off with people. Um, uh, I mean, after a, a long period of time and a, sh- a short conversation, he kind of, he's just really great at, at just jumping right back in. So, hmm. uh, how'd you get in this whole world of, so protecting people's ideas, mm-hmm and products what's the craziest thing you protected it depends it depends on how you define crazy right (laughs) (laughs) there's i mean there's so many interesting different things um i would say probably the most unusual thing i protected from the standpoint of "Mm, how are you going to monetize that was um is this couple in los angeles came to me a long time ago um, looking to patent a new way of tying shoelaces that it doesn't come untied. Okay. It's basically a new sequence of. It's knots. called like a double knot. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, you know, it's it's hard to remember. It's it's been it's probably been about 20 years at this point. But uh, they, it was yeah, a series of knots that um, still relatively simple, but it doesn't come undone in the same way that when you tie a regular bow on your shoelaces. It's like they wanted to patent that. I said okay, but now once we patent it how are you going to make money from that they didn't seem to really care (laughs) what it would be interesting it's a fair question they're like rich i'm not paying you to figure that out just get me the patent (laughs) but i mean you were you're looking out for people's wallets also i do yeah and and i i want people to go into the process knowing what they're getting knowing what the risks are knowing what the upside is for them. Like in this case, like how are you going to monetize it? Is there an, a potential upside? And, mm-hmm. um, you know, but the value that people are seeking when they're seeking a patent isn't necessarily what you expect. It's like you think like you make an assumption like, okay, someone's doing a patent because they want to make a lot of money. You know, it's like sometimes it's, I'd say it's typically an experience that they're seeking. It's maybe the experience of having something that they created out there and famous, right? Maybe it's the experience of having made a difference with lots of people. Um, you know, maybe mm-hmm. it's the experience of just having done it. Um, so it's usually an experience that they're seeking. Um, and I can get behind that. I mean, it's like, the, it doesn't have to be about them making money. Um, that's commensurate with the money they yeah. spent on the process. As long as that experience they're seeking has that value for them. Right. Then so let's talk about a couple of use cases, right? So you do patents and trademarks. And one of the ways um, there's e-commerce people that, you know, seek this out. There's SaaS companies, product companies. What's, what's a lucrative way you've seen someone use a patent or trademark? Well, I mean, probably the most lucrative ways is, is to license it. Mm-hmm. Is to have a a, a a basically a deal set up where someone is manufacturing the product and paying a royalty to you. Yeah. And what are so, what are the like, best examples of that you've seen? I remember. Well, I mean, I, yeah. Go ahead. So uh, Carlos Alvarez, who is like you know you you weren't sure of when we passed over the podcast, um, he'll tell a story about how um, he licensed he, he had a product that he was selling. He's a, he's a very successful ecom guy. He had yeah. A product he was selling that ultimately he licensed. 
And he makes more from the licensing than he ever did from actually selling the products. Mm. So that's amazing. Yeah. I mean, so, so there's an example and, and it's a pretty common model licensing. Um, and, and, and probably one of the most, um, sought after relationships of people that have ideas where they, you know, they are looking for someone who's going to take it on and, and get it out there and then pay them a royalty. It's not always easy to find someone like that. Actually, it's quite difficult often to find a licensing right. relationship, finding that person who values what you have, um, and also is, is in a position to make it happen. Like those yep. two things. Yep. Um, but yeah, that's, um, who are, but, who do you consider experts in licensing? So that I, I remember, you know, um, I had the founder of big league chew on and he basically, I don't know if you consider what he did, license it, licensed it, but he basically, yeah, I think he just licensed it. They sold it, but he gets a royalty. So, um, it was really interesting to hear how he created it, but then he doesn't do any of the manufacturing or anything like that. It's just, he handed it and now he just gets a piece of every thing of big league shoe sold. Who you consider expert at licensing? I'd say Paul Miller. Do you know Paul Miller? Uh, I was going to mention him. Yep. <laughs> okay. We know so many of the same people, but yeah, um, I, I would say Paul is, uh, is the guy that, uh, that I um, that I respect the most in terms of what he's accomplished with licensing and uh, um, yep there he is with cozy phones and he um, um, and he's worked licensing in the other direction where he has licensed famous characters as you can see on the website right. there, like uh, Sesame Street and Nickelodeon characters um, and so he's gotten permission to use them on his product mm. um, made some money for those companies but. Uh, in turn, sold quite a number of products. Yep. You know, I have another guest for your podcast, actually, Rich. Um, I have someone coming on tonight. He's a friend. His name is Steve Rosen. He okay. uh, has the company Create On. And basically, he helps put together licensing deals for companies. So he works with Magnetiles. If, I don't know if anyone has kids at Magnetiles. And he connects Magnetiles to, let's say, Sesame Street and creates specialized Sesame Street Magnetiles. And other, you know, they got him into Target and large big box stores in addition to online. So he'd be a good person for your podcast, but also like has done licensing at like a large scale. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to have him on. I, yeah. mean, I think there's a lot that he could share with um, with my audience about innovation and about how he's helped people make those connections. Um, so best ways, lucrative ways. So that's, that's one way people have used licensing, uh, uh, you know, patents, trademarks for licensing purposes. What are other lucrative ways people can use trademarks or patents? Well, I'd say the other major one is if you're in the business, if you're in the business and selling products, then you use the patent to, um, create your market share and maintain your market share and basically mm -hmm. prevent competition. So, um, so essentially, um, you're preventing other people from making a product like that. And that kind of helps you cement your position in the market. If when, when you've patented some aspect of the product that the consumer is calling for so that they want the product with your feature, they don't want it if it doesn't have that feature you're effectively preventing people from com competing with you because it builds a moat around it builds a moat around your product or company yeah exactly i mean people can sell competitive products but not with the thing that consumers are asking for then you've got a great patent then you've got something which uh, uh mm -hmm. which is is making your company a lot of money yeah, I mean, if you watch, I love watching Shark Tank, and that's a question they ask: is like, is this defensible? Is this protectable? Is this unique? And the people who come in with patents or trade, you know, they have that. It's definitely added value. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's one of the first questions that they ask: is like, do you have a patent? Because it, it it's, uh, you know, it, it it really cements whether they own the idea or not, and. Uh, you know, if you don't own IP, then they're just investing in you, your know-how, your um, 
kind of like the sales that you've been able to achieve and possibly if they inject some cash in, they could achieve more sales or grow your business. But if you own the IP, there's lots of other opportunities. It's not just about what you've created. It's about what other people that they could work a deal with mm -hmm. could create with the IP that you own. So talk about, we'll talk about e-commerce, SaaS. What's another category we should talk about in this patent and, and trademark world? Any others? Um, yeah, let's see. So e-com, I mean, generally product. people that yeah. have products. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, what's a, what's an e-com example of how people have used? Well, um, e-com and if you, and you're thinking in particular of Amazon sellers, um, often, um, having the patent can be the thing that you use to clear the uh, kind of clear the deck in, in terms of other people that are selling competitive products. You have, uh, even a design patent, which is for, for the look of a product only. Um, but you have a design patent, um, design patent for a product. You see a competitor selling a product that looks like yours. You make an IP complaint to Amazon and they shut them down. So, um, so that's a, a great use of a patent and, and, and Amazon tends to defer to the IP owners. And so between you and your competitor, it's way better if you're the one holding the patent. Yeah. And you've helped a lot of Amazon sellers from the patent. And then what about trademark? From a trademark standpoint yeah and and trademarks as well i mean trademarks are a no-brainer it's like if you have any branding you should protect it with a trademark um because that reminds me i need to hire you for something by the way <laughs> i'm also uh, a client of riches but so yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay my pleasure whatever you yeah. need but um because but amazon almost demands that for your brand right now you know they want you to they, they want you to submit uh official trademark yeah, if, if you want to be in brand registry, then yeah. you need to have uh, a registered trademark. A few years back, um, the, you could have gotten into the program without a registered trademark, but now it's um, um, it's 100% um, that you need a registered trademark to do it. Yep. Um, and we talked about some of the licensing uh, aspects of getting the, the patent. What about SaaS companies? I'm thinking, well, SaaS, SaaS, what do I need? How do What do I need a... Uh, patent or trademark for? Well, if you're a SaaS company, so you've got some type of software platform online and you're selling memberships or things of that nature, um, not all SaaS companies need patents for sure, but sometimes you have a, a unique set of features. You've got um, something that your software does that none of your competitors are doing. Uh, it pays to protect it with a patent. Hmm. So, um, you know, if you have something that really makes your software unique, that's a way to leverage that so that you don't have a lot of um, or a bunch of me too's coming along and doing the same thing that you're doing. But of course, with SaaS companies, branding um, is um, it is critical as well. You know, like you go to Zoom or StreamYard or any of these platforms is that name that people are looking for. And uh, and so you need to establish your rights in that in that brand recognition. So Rich, I, you know, when people get started into law, there's a million different avenues you can take. So what made you decide to choose this? And was it always this? Or were, did you have something in the beginning that you were doing that was different? Right. Well, it was always this as long as it was law, because really what it was is that I, I, um, I started with engineering. I studied electrical engineering. And um, I realized in the course of that, that being an electrical engineer wasn't quite for me. Um, just kind sounds of sounds terrible. Well, working on the same project day in and day no, out. just hard. Five years electrical time, engineering. Yeah. It's just what? It's just hard. Yeah. I had all the, you know, when I had the physics, you know, calculus based physics class, you know, my background was biochemistry. It was the, I had a lot of uh, engineers, and I was like, wow, like your curriculum is tough. Yeah, well, I, I still, I, you know, it's not like I, I got to escape it. I still finished, I got a degree in electrical engineering. <laughs> And then I went to law school. Um, but really, it was during that process that I said, I, I need to do something a little bit more. I, I wasn't keen on being a, an engineer as an occupation. And so I went to law school with the intention of becoming a patent lawyer. Because in order to do patent law, you need to have an engineering or science background, uh, which is kind of fun because when I'm in law school and, and everyone was talking about what type of fields, oh, I'm going to go into criminal law, I'm going to go to corporate law. And I told them about patent law. Some of them say, like, that sounds really interesting. Maybe I'll go into that. And hmm. I'll ask them, so, well, what did you study undergrad? And they'll say, uh, political science. It's like, well, too late. 
<laughs> so uh, by the time a lot of people learn about this field, say in law school, it's already too late because they don't have the technical background you need to go into it. You mentioned tying shoes as an interesting use case. What yeah. are some other interesting you, you know, cases that you've seen throughout your career? Um, okay, so um, a, a good friend of mine now, I mean, it's because we've been friends for 20 years now since we started working together. Um, he's invented from California. He runs a bus upholstery company. <laughs> he um, basically has um, uh, like transit authorities um, hire him to reupholster 700 buses, let's say. Um, and so he, that's what he does. And he discovered some time ago that there was a major problem in transit authorities where they, um, they, they have a, a cushion seat, um, that they want to provide a comfortable ride for their customers. But then, you know, late at night, someone takes a knife out and they, <laughs> they knife the seat. It's they terrible. It open. Yeah. I've been on those buses. Like, the front of it's been slashed, you know what I mean? And you know, someone just vandalized it. Exactly, exactly. And so um, so then it, it's a, a toss up between giving someone or giving your customers a, a hard plastic seat that's really uncomfortable and giving them something that's more comfortable to ride in but could easily get vandalized. And so what my mm. client came up with was um, a, um, a seat insert that was really the best of both worlds, which it provided a, a, a cushioning, but it was still vandalism proof. Mm. And he had a very clever way of doing that. And we got a patent on it. And it's mm. been the thing that's that's got him um, contracts for more than a decade. So they all use him because of this particular innovation that he's patented. Mm. So. I can see that being a use case for stadium seating and other things too does he use it for anything else or is it just for kind of bus um you know that's interesting i mean i i uh uh i don't know that it's that he's used it outside of the bus business mm. that's the business he's in that he's done very well in. Mm. so what else what else uh i like hearing the cool ideas people of what they've patented um let's see i mean and and it's funny that um, I'm like a senile person, you know, like when you're senile, like you remember things from when you were a kid better than you remember what just happened. So like the stories come <laughs> like up to me 30 like, years ago, I remember all those, but last week, right. not so much. Exactly. Exactly. So like, you know, I have another client who had a, um, um, a hairband, like for, for tying up your hair and, uh, having it look like natural hair. Um, but there was a problem in that if you, um, any of the synthetic hair fibers, like things that actually look like hair are not elastic. Mm. So you couldn't stretch it around the ponytail. Um, so what she came up with was, um, a set of, um, hair fibers joined with an elastic part end to end into a circle. So then the elastic part stretched mm. and then the hair part didn't, but you know, when I make my ponytails, <laughs> no, I can't just, relate to this. I normally do it is, you know, you, um, you, you make one just like the way you rubber band something, right. Is you, you put it around once and then you double it up and wrap it around then you double it up and wrap it around. So she, um, she realized that she could do this and still wrap the hair part all the way around the elastic part to hide it. So it just looked like your hair mm. tying up your hair. And, uh, she, um, you know, we managed to get a broad patent on it that she um, um, then got the, the product into um, thousands of stores nationwide. Um, and she had a major um, hair supply company knock the product off. And, um, you know, um, she sued them for, for infringement and, and she won. And the other patent attorneys said that we can't break this patent. Yeah. So that was a. Uh, um, rather successful. That's one, awesome. Say. I'm curious because you've seen so many different ideas come through Go your, ahead. your, yeah. Um, what have you seen lately or what, do, what have you thought about, you just saw something and you thought, wow, that's a really good idea. It could be patented already or whatever it is, but what are some just good ideas you've seen maybe from a software or from, from a product standpoint? Cause I you could look through this different lens than most people Right. What do, what do you, you consider some like really cool, innovative things either now or, you know, lately that you've seen? 
Oh, wow. You're putting me on the spot. Um, yeah, you know, I, anything I, technology wise or product wise. Um, yeah, I mean, um, I think a lot of these um, uh, streaming platforms is pretty pretty innovative. The one I'm using now, Ecamm, uh, I'm actually really impressed with what they've done yeah. with that. And you know, it's kind of funny, like where um, Canon, uh, you know, Canon makes um, DSLR cameras. They came up with an announcement about a month or two ago, like, "Hey, everybody, we've just um, uh, had a breakthrough where you can stream from your still camera." You could set it up. Usually, they have a great lens, and so there's great imaging. They said you could stream from from this group of Canon cameras to your IBM PC and use it as a webcam. Well, that's great, but that left out Mac users, right? And it left out a whole bunch of cameras, including mine. The Canon 6D, you know, wasn't on their list. I was like, oh, that's great. Would have been really cool. I could go buy a new two thousand dollar camera and be on it. But Ecamm, they apparently they figured out how to do it, and so now I could stream my um you know five six year old canon camera with gorgeous imagery and uh um you know in a way that this major company canon wasn't able to so yep. you can see so. Gan glenn i interviewed them a long time ago. glenn and ken they're twins i think they're geniuses rich really i mean what uh -huh. they do but um they from a young age created just some amazing software. They, he sold the first app, a Palm OS app for astronomers. Wow. To calculate the position of stars. So if that doesn't signify genius, I don't know what does. No, but okay. you know what fascin fascinates me about that too? Yeah. Um, is that I wonder though, like when you're selling a Palm um, OS app, yeah. when do you realize that the that the, the jig is up that people are not going to be using palm next year <laughs> you know what i mean like i, I mean when that. do you people go to the next platform Black yeah people that are making yeah. blackberry accessories like when did they realize like okay it's time to pivot to something else yeah and, and you know apparently they're you know they're entrepreneurs they're like they've had successful businesses so they 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 know that that's what i would want to ask them is like when did you know that hey it's been great with palm but it's not going to be around next year. So yeah. like, let's not invest any more in, in this. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, it seems like they learned their lesson if, if it is a lesson because, you know, you see their tagline, we make your Mac life better. They probably don't know. They don't see Apple. You know, everything may have its shelf life, but Apple's going strong. So they build everything on the Mac right now. Or not everything, but at least the ones, uh, a bunch of these are built on the Mac. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Um, you know, Rich. First of all, I have I have one last question to ask you. Before I do, I want to point people towards your site and your podcast. Um, you can go to you know goldsteinpatentlaw.com and check out more. You can go to their podcast tab and listen to, or if you're on iTunes, Innovations and Breakthroughs, check it out. Um, I always ask since it's Spread Insider, what's been maybe a low moment that you had to push through and what's been a very proud moment? All right. Well, I'm a business owner um, and I have employees. So <laughs> I'd have to say making payroll um, some, you know, I've been in business now for just 26 years. And so there have been times when making payroll was really damn tough. Um, so I would say that sticks out as a low moment that's occurred, you know, many times over that period um and um something i'm sp particularly proud of is i would say the book is 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 being asked to write the book and and putting that out and then the the um um you know the reviews i received and the people that have told me that they learned so much from it um and you know i'm just going to tag on with another thing too is videos i made six videos um nine years ago. And, um, you know, like I, I did them in a studio, but it was hot that day and I was sweaty and I had a big pimple on my forehead. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, and my suit didn't fit too well. It was bunching up and stuff. And, and, but nevertheless, those videos, like people over and over again have told me how much that they've learned from me, whether they worked with me or not, they learned about the process. It kept them from wasting money. 
Um, it, it had them feel confident in going into the patent process. So I guess I'm particularly proud of those two things, the book and the videos, because of the way in which it's made a difference for people. So, Rich, where should we point people towards? We have Goldstein Patent Law. You have a lot of resources. What what part of the site should they check out? I mean, obviously, well, you have questions. You could email you and contact you right. through the website. What plate? Where should they start on your website? Uh, well, yeah, I'd say you go to the videos, which is that you could navigate to it, or you can mm -hmm. go to goldsteinpatentlaw.com slash videos. Mm -hmm. So, okay. um, so that's uh, um you know, and, um, you know, that's probably one of the, the best places to, uh, um, to learn about the process. Um, nice. and, um, you know, in general, there's just, there's a lot of resources on there. There's a lot of, uh, uh of information to help you prevent you from just making the wrong decision and going in the wrong direction with this. I mean, but ultimately if you have an idea that you believe in, and you feel that um, it's something that might have legs, then, I mean, we've got a process for that. It's called a patent evaluation where we um, kind of find out from you what you're trying to do. We do some research to see what other people have done, and then we figure out whether um, it's possible to protect it and what the options would be. Yeah. So ultimately, that's kind of what you want to do. If you want, you could talk to my team and find out about those options. But yeah. That's it. And then again, lots of free resources there. Watch the videos, learn about the process. So where can people just do a broad search? And this gets people in trouble because like I'm looking at this part of your site, why free online patent research could end up costing you thousands. Mm -hmm. Where is someone just to get a general sense of, is this even possible to trademark or patent? What should people look yeah. at? What sites? Well, with regard to patenting, um, you can go to Google Patents, which is patents, P-A-T-E-N-T-S, Dot google.com so google has a search engine for patents and uh, one of the cool things about it uh, and this is the best use of it is if you do some searching you just type in a query like you do any other google search and then up pop a bunch of patents so if you do that and you find out that hey there's already patents for the same idea then then that's probably time well spent because you you find out hey i shouldn't bother with this and you didn't spend any money. And so now you've learned easily not to bother with this idea and to move on to something else. But if you search and you search and you search and you d still don't find anything like your idea, um, that's where people waste money is by then thinking, OK, well, it's not out there. Let me invest heavily into it. Let me do a patent application. Let me build a prototype. Let me get the product on the market. Um, very often people search to the best of their ability. But if we do a professional search, we still find it. So they search the best of their ability. They, they, they think it doesn't exist based on their search, but then we do a search and we find it. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's, it would be complicated to go into, but, um, but basically that's a good starting point search. Yeah. yeah. Patents.google.com, any other online resources just to get a general sense if it's, if they have a shot. Yeah, and if it's a trademark, then go to the the uh, USPTO, or the United States Patent and Trademark Office, to search trademarks. That's the best place. So you go to USPTO.gov, and that's how you can you can look up other trademarks and find other things that are similar. You're not always going to know what you're looking at in terms of like what it means when you find other things like it, um, but that's a great place to start. Cool. Check out that. Check out goldsteinpatentlaw.com, the podcast. Rich, always a pleasure. Thank you so much, Jeremy. I really appreciate it. Oh, and thank you for getting me into podcasting. Like most of all, like what you mentioned the beginning of the show of how like strongly and passionately you feel about podcasting being great for, for people to connect with others. Um, you pushed me and I really appreciate that you did. I mean, it's been awesome. So thank you for that. You're very welcome. The best thing I've ever done. Me too. And for my relationships. I won't say that about my wife, but in general. <laughs> okay. okay. I'll qualify like that too. Uh, okay. Thanks, Rich. Okay. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire. Came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.